Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College. This is video H of a long series of videos on the urinary system, but we're finally starting with the kidney physiology. In other words, we're finally, we finally have enough anatomy and histology behind us to where we can begin to learn how our kidneys form urine. The formation of urine is actually a pretty complex process and I've already introduced you a little bit to the first process that must occur and that is filtration. You already know that it requires a pressure gradient and that it also only occurs at the level of the renal corpuscle which of course is located in the renal cortex. And then you've learned a little bit about reabsorption that is the primary function of your proximal convoluted tubule but there's a third function called secretion. We're going to focus on just filtration in this particular video. The kidneys are magnificent organs in the body because they succeed in filtering all of our plasma volume 60 times every single day. So our kidneys work really hard. Now ultimately after they filtered our blood plasma, our blood, we end up with something called a filtrate in that Bowman's capsule. That filtrate is not at all what urine looks like. So a lot of things must still happen to that filtrate before we can call it urine. So first of all, what is the filtrate? The filtrate is everything that was filtered from the blood's plasma and clearly the cells cannot make it through that filtration membrane neither can big proteins they just cannot cross the fenestrations the basement membrane and the filtration slits so what we do end up with in the filtrate is something that is plasma without those big proteins and with quite a bit of good nutrients still in there, a bunch of water, and then of course also um, waste products along with all kinds of electrolytes. So there needs to be a way to somehow reclaim those nutrients down the road, and that's where we will need to talk about reabsorption and ultimately also a process that is opposite to reabsorption called secretion. So the urine that is really your final form of very manipulated filtrate is mostly water with a bunch of waste products, nitrogenous waste products such as urea and uric acid and creatinine and then some electrolytes. So in order to make urine, we have to go first of all through the process of filtration and that only occurs at the level of the renal corpuscle. That's the only place where this occurs. And you know by now that the renal corpuscle is located in the cortex. After filtration has occurred, reabsorption will kick in and along with reabsorption, we're going to see secretion. So reabsorption and secretion can occur simultaneously. However, reabsorption is the main function of the proximal convoluted tubule. In other words, most reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. And so what does this all mean? Well, if we look at our arrows, we get a better feel in which direction water and all kinds of substances dissolved in the water are moving. So if we first start with filtration, you know that the blood is going to enter via the afferent arteriole into the glomerulus and because of the hydrostatic pressure in the blood being higher than that in the Bowman's capsule, a bunch of water and other substances will be pushed through that filtration membrane. And what we end up with in the Bowman's capsules lumen is referred to as the filtrate. When that filtrate then enters into our renal tubule, 
we'll, we'll see that, especially in the proximal convoluted tubule, but also throughout, that some of the uh, nutritious substances in particular, even electrolytes, are going to be returned to the blood. So notice the direction of the arrow this time. So what is in the filtrate is now going to be returned to the blood. Even a bunch of water is going to be returned to the blood. We call that reabsorption. So if we put our numbers here, then number one is filtration, as illustrated here. And then number two is reabsorption, as illustrated here. And then finally, there is something called secretion. And if you follow the direction of the arrow, it's opposite that of reabsorption. So what does that mean? Well, essentially, the blood is going to be given an opportunity to get rid of more waste products, perhaps, um, even after filtration has already occurred, right? So reabsorption and secretion occur after filtration has already occurred. Um, or it's also a way for us to regulate the pH of the blood and solute concentrations, etc. All right, so we're going to look at each one of these different processes, which substances depend on it, and um, whether it is a form of active transport, passive transport, or potentially both. And in this video, we're going to focus on just glomerular filtration. By now, I hope that you realize that filtration only occurs in the renal corpuscles, which are located in the cortex, nowhere else. And you already know that filtration depends on the pressure gradient. And it's a passive process. This is important for you to realize. There is no ATP expended. We're following a pressure gradient, meaning that water and solutes are moving from a high pressure environment to a low pressure environment. And where is the, the high pressure environment? That would be in our glomerulus. Where is the low pressure environment? That would be in our BC, our Bowman's capsule. It's also a relatively non-selective process. That might not be the best term to use because after all, that filtration membrane is selective to some extent with regards to size, but it's not really going to select based on whether a substance is a nutrient or a waste product or water. Okay, and so it's completely dependent on a pressure gradient, differences in hydrostatic pressure, no ATP involved. So you've already looked at the histological differences between the afferent arteriole and efferent arteriole, as an afferent typically has a wider diameter than the efferent arteriole, which creates more resistance in the efferent arteriole, and therefore a bit of a backup in the glomerulus, and that creates that uh, higher pressure in the glomerulus, which of course leads to better filtration. We also see that the filtration membrane is quite permeable, even though we've discussed the levels of, of um, size differentiation or what size molecule each layer, that is the endothelial layer versus the basement membrane layer versus the uh, pedicel layer, uh, what size of molecules it allows to pass through. As a reminder, the blood pressure in the glomerulus is significantly higher than in the traditional capillary beds. You know, we see a blood pressure in the glomerulus of about 55, while in our other capillary beds, it's more like 20 to 30, maybe 40 millimeters of mercury. So all of this leads to a much higher net filtration pressure. Remember your net filtration pressure formula. You learn about this when you learn about how capillary beds go through the process of filtration at one end and reabsorption at the other end and how that creates lymph. So how you calculated net filtration pressure there is going to apply here as well. As mentioned before, our kidneys really are fantastic organs considering how hard they work. 
And there are some numbers here you really should pay attention to. First of all, your kidneys take up about a fourth or a fifth of all the oxygen um, in the body when at rest, when we're at rest. So that's quite a, a significant amount. And then based on the fact that enormous amounts of blood pass through all of the glomeruli, we see that ultimately about 120 milliliters of all the blood that passes through the kidneys per minute, which is about a liter, so about a liter of blood passes through the kidneys um, uh, per minute. Ultimately, what ends up as filtrate in the Bowman's capsule is about 120 milliliters. And this is a number you definitely need to know. So I'll circle what you need to know, the 120 mils. So this is, you know, in one minute, I should say. We pass through about a liter per minute through those glomeruli and your kidneys consume about a fifth to a quarter of all of the oxygen and that is at rest by the way. So if we look at these numbers then we see that per day we can crank out 180 liters of filtrate. Divide that by four that gives you about 45 gallons, right? Um, if you look at what other capillary buds do when they're forming their filtrate, which we call lymph in the other capillary beds, they only crank out about three liters, maybe four. Again, 180 liters versus three or four liters. So your kidneys are amazingly uh, efficient and effective at what they do. But still, so that's the filtrate. Remember, that filtrate still needs to go through the process of reabsorption and secretion. Well, by the time reabsorption and secretion has, have had their hands on the filtrate, look at this, we only end up with a little over a liter of urine a day. And this also shows you that our kidneys are really, really good at reclaiming a lot of water from our urine. And this is an important thing because we are, after all, animals that are adapted to live on land, right? We're, mam we're terrestrial mammals. And therefore, we're constantly fighting dehydration. We're not like a fish. We're not like a, a, an animal that lives in a watery environment that doesn't have to deal so much with dehydration. We do. We're constantly fighting losing too much water, but we have kidneys that can really do a good job uh, preventing that. So one of the numbers I asked you to memorize is the amount of filtrate that we can form per minute. And that is referred to as our glomerular filtration rate, which is about 120 to 125 mils per minute, give or take a little bit. Now, how much of this filtrate is formed per minute? is clearly going to depend on our net filtration pressure. We see a direct relationship between net filtration pressure and glomerular filtration rate. Right? I hope you're familiar with this little mathematical symbol. But also we need to think of the filtration membrane. Right? If the filtration membrane has a, a nice healthy surface area produced by those pedicels of the podocytes, great. And if we have just the right permeability, it's not, there's no damage to where we have uh, an increased permeability or a decreased permeability because of the buildup of scar tissue, for instance, um, then we, we will um, not see any major impact on the GFR. Now, you know, GFR is one of those other numbers that you'll very often see on a patient's lab report. And particularly when there's suspicion of problems with kidneys, you'll see that your patient will also have a number that represents his or her creatinine clearance rate. Now, without going into a huge amount of detail, first of all, creatinine is one of the nitrogenous wastes that we find in urine, along with urea and uric acid. 
But what's interesting about creatinine is that once it leaves via filtration, it never leaves the filtrate again. So it's completely filtered from the blood and stays in the filtrate. It doesn't get reabsorbed. It doesn't move back and forth between the blood and the nephron. And so when we, we can look at the numbers referred to as the creatinine clearance rate to get an idea of how healthy a patient's kidneys are because this creatinine clearance rate can be used to get a, an estimate of what the patient's GFR is. There are all kinds of calculations to estimate a GFR. We cannot directly measure it, obviously. We cannot stick anything into the kidneys and measure it directly. So we need to find different ways of, of estimating it. And again, by looking at the creatinine levels, uh, we can, we can um, come up with a way of estimating a patient's GFR. Okay, so we, we know that the net filtration pressure in our renal corp corpuscle is directly related to the GFR. So what that means is if the, G if the net filtration pressure goes up, that's going to increase the GFR correspondingly. If the net filtration pressure goes down, the GFR goes down as well. That's literally what that means. So remember how you calculate your net filtration pressure. You need to look at the difference between the hydrostatic pressure in the blood and the osmotic pressure in the blood. And you need to look at the hydrostatic pressure in the capsule and its osmotic pressure in the capsule. So the hydrostatic pressure of our blood entering into our glomerulus is about 55 millimeters of mercury. If we look at the pressure created by all the albumin and other major proteins in the blood, we see that it's about 30 millimeters of mercury. And of course, these two forces work opposite. Hydrostatic pressure pushes water and its substances out of the blood while the osmotic pressure wants to hold on to it all. So we look at the difference between these two, 55 minus 30 leads to 25. And then we subtract from that uh, the difference between these two forces within our uh, Bowman's capsule. And in the Bowman's capsule, if the patient is, you know, pretty healthy, there, there will not be any proteins in the, the filtrate. So we can, you know, we can pretty much set that to zero and really not worry about it anymore. So that leaves us with just the pressure created by the amount of filtrate present in the Bowman's capsule. In other words, the capsular hydrostatic pressure, and that is about 15 millimeters of mercury. So we're worried the difference between these two was 25, and then we need to still subtract from that 15, and that leaves us with a, a, a number of approximately plus 10. Oops, I'm sorry, let's, there we go, plus 10, right? So that is our net filtration pressure, and the fact that it has a plus associated with it tells us that we're seeing as our overall net filtration pressure that water and its substances are moved out of the blood into the Bowman's capsule. And here you see this nicely uh, summarized. Here's your formula for the net filtration pressure with the G standing for glomerular, with the BC standing for Bowman's capsule. Remember that the osmotic pressure in the um, Bowman's capsule should be basically zero because there are no proteins present. And that leaves us then ultimately with our number of plus 10, meaning that under normal circumstances at rest, we should see that filtration occurs from the blood into the Bowman's capsule. But you're, you're, you, you know, based on this formula, what you've learned about it, you can imagine that if this pressure, this hydrostatic pressure, if it goes up or if it goes down, 
it can really start messing around with our plus 10 here, right? So let's say that our hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus now drops just five millimeters of mercury down to from, you know, we go from 55 down to 50. We're now having a net filtration pressure of only plus five. Okay, so filtration is still occurring, but clearly not as fast or not as well. If we drop even a little bit further, as a matter of fact, if we go down to 45, now we end up with a net filtration pressure of zero. In other words, urine is not being formed. So even, even though it's only a, a small drop, a drop of about 15%, we're already seeing that we can't make any urine. So dehydration can be a real threat to your patients, by the way, rendering their kidneys uh, non-functional and they will not be producing urine. And of course you might say, well, fine, no urine produced, but realize that also means that the blood is not being um, processed in the sense that uh, many of its waste products are not removed. So with the information we just covered in the back of your minds, I'm hoping you're beginning to realize that the kidneys must regulate the glomerular filtration rate very tightly. And they need to be able to do this independent of what is happening systemically at some level. You know, when things get really out of control, when we get really, really stressed out, um, the sympathetic nervous system is going to do whatever it needs to, to keep the body alive. But... Um, you know, under normal conditions, your kidneys, under normal routine day-to-day, minute-to-minute activities, your kidneys are going to try to keep a pretty steady GFR. And if the GFR were to get too high, let's say, that means that we're filtering way too fast, which creates a whole lot more filtrate with way much too much, way too many solutes in it. But those solutes are probably not going to be able to get reabsorbed fast enough because the filtrate is flowing so fast. So now we're losing all kinds of good nutrients in our urine. On the other hand, if filtration rate, the filtration rate is way too low, um, then we are going to see a much lower filtrate flow. And now the filtrate hangs out too long in the tubules before it gets dumped into the ureter. So now there's way too much time for reabsorption and perhaps even wastes get reabsorbed. So there's all of these different things that need to work just right in our kidneys in order for us to produce a urine that allows for our blood to still have the right solute composition, just the right amount of water, just the amount, right amount of, of uh, pH, volume, etc., etc.